and the history of slash and burn agriculture um, is especially controversial. And so it's a political move to define it in such terms, but it's also um, it's also defending their their approach to conservation in some ways. So it's not totally diverging from protected areas in that sense. They're really trying to point out that we're still protecting the natural growth. Um, so you can read these in a lot of different ways. Um, and this is kind of a big one. Um, so this contains a lot of information, but what I really want to point to is that they, this person pointed out that to conserve isn't necessarily to protect because today it's difficult to um, talk about not touching natural resources or not touching a natural environment. And I think that really points to the idea of the Amazon as being this pristine wilderness, Eden, um, you know, frontier area that, and when we think about the populations that live there, um, perhaps the images come up of people who are very in touch with their natural environment and don't harm it, but the reality is somewhat different. And so what they really point to is how do we use these resources um, to assure that populations can, can use them sustainably. So, um, and this final quote um, really points out very specifically the utilitarian aspects of the natural environment and why we should protect it for these reasons. Um, because it's a source of economic income. It brings us, or it gives us diverse goods and services that are necessary for develop, to develop our communities. Um, I mean, inherently human populations. And so, and then to, it provides us, we don't know yet what other things it could provide for us. So referring to maybe medic medicinal plants that are not yet discovered or their value is not yet discovered. So, um, so these are some of the results that I pointed out. And some of these I didn't discuss as much in this presentation, but are covered a little bit more in the paper. But um, as I said, this research has really um, been exploratory, and it kind of set the basis for what I want to do in the future. Um, because through this, I started to think about the fact that many of these NGOs are working in rural areas, working out of the cities that are on the edge of the Amazon, but, you know, basing all of their projects in these rural areas. And though I think that they're very forward-looking or practical in their approaches, I think that they, that they leave out the urban component of the Amazon. And so I started to do some more research that is not included in the paper about urban communities in the Amazon. And now the Amazon is about 70% urbanized. And so what I think moving forward would be looking at why not only NGOs, this project focused on NGOs, but why scholars, why governments, and, and why NGOs are not so concerned with how to make the cities of the Amazon more sustainable, and how we would go about planning more ecologically sustainable cities in that region, because there's not enough attention. So, and then again, thinking about how humans fit into the natural environment there, and how, and if humans are something other than natural, or if they're something other than nature, um, and not taking nature out of this, these urban environments, how we can plan these cities without making them artificial and still taking into account the larger rainforest environment, um, especially as most of them are growing from migrants coming in from rural Amazonia um, and either living full-time in the city or part-time in the city and part-time um, in rural areas still um, pursuing agricultural um, pursuits. So, um, and this was a final 
um, quote from, or small quote from the questionnaires, uh, soy optimista. So I'm an optimist. And this kind of refers to the idealized future. Um, even on a personal level, I think a lot of people who work for NGOs are very, um, they're optimistic and they're very, um, they have very high ideals about what they think can be done. Um, but I, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, um, considering their, their practical and their realistic ways to go about conservation. Thank you. similar to Union, right? But, um, and, I'm, and I know there's possible like a, a personal reason for this, but uh, from what I heard, I'm not too acquainted with the Brazilian example for education. In Mexico, in the 30s, when Lázaro Cárdenas changed the, the constitution so that there was a socialist education in Mexico, it was a, a huge problem and scandal and, and stuff, and they had to change it for the next uh, uh, president. So. Um, um, what, I, what I want to ask is, is there like a s socialist oriented education in Brazil under Lula's uh, reign or this is a comparison you're trying to do uh, with your own frame of reference? I, I, I think it's more of the later so I'm trying to, so like I, I came across the school and, and first I, I, I was more interested in African students and the learning universities in general, but then I, like, I learned about the university and was just about to be established. And I think my, my engagement with um, other schools in uh, former um, socialist countries is more of trying to build a frame and, and thinking about the conceptualization of solidarity education. And um, I'm before brilliance, so I'm, I'm, like, I'm moving towards that research. So it will later on probably be more of the questions, like what is it? like? Is it anything different? Is it a side of possibility? Is it a different way of thinking about partnership in education for development of countries or not? I have a question for <laughs> um, Considering that a lot of the countries you're talking about are former colonies of Portugal, what role does, it, if any, does Portugal play in this, in this whole paradigm that you're talking about? So. I think you get here you get into a deeper conceptual level of things. Um, first of all, the community of Portuguese speaking countries was initiated by Brazil. So you certainly have uh, and, and often when you talk to Brazilians you get this idea, oh Portugal or even even Mozambique when you talk to Mozambique, oh oh Portugal, nobody cares about Portugal. But then like we are all looking towards Brazil. So there's there's there's, there's this idea. But then of course Portugal and it goes more into like thinking about the Foucaultian ideas of like or, or again, or postmodern ideas of how to conceptualize and how to think about the world. Because Portugal has uh, occupied sort of a space at the margin, even for Europe for a very long time. And it's a uh, part of its like uh, the um, it is part of its empire record and it's it's building and um, trying to um, promote its position within Europe as well. And now it is very interesting, and certainly something I need to read more into, and I will, um, is like how does the relationship between Brazil, like how, is it a relationship between Brazil and politically speaking African countries, or is it actually some sort of a, a relational triangle? Yeah. So, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, mainly the NGOs that um, I talked to were in Puerto Maldonado, and uh, are based in Puerto Maldonado, 
Madre de Dios, and they did most of their work in Madre de Dios, or in the Ecuadorian Amazon, or in Bolivian Amazon, so all highland Amazonian areas. Um, and to address, most of them are um, are local NGOs, and if they have an internet or a U.S. component, it's that they have they're actually like sister organizations. Um, there was one particular organization that I got a, a lot of feedback from that had offices in the United States, but a legal entity, a separate NGO in Peru that well worked in Peru and Bolivia, but it was a Peruvian NGO. But they were like they acted as sister organizations. So sometimes they got funding through the work of the U.S.-based organization. Um, but the respondents were all, um, they were all citizens of those countries, but they were not from the Amazonian region. Um, they were from larger cities, such as Cusco, Lima, um, or something like that. I, I have a question for Scarlett. So, um, you mentioned that you So I guess, what relationship did deputies have with people who would have been like the Patronas decades ago? I mean, this is kind of a newer entity. Is this is this a continuity from other type of relationships, or is this a really new type of thing? Um, I think it's a new type of relationship. Um, I think that 
Can you finish the second? So, so you're asking about in the region? So this, for the second part of the question, yeah. you're asking in the region, what's the history of... Yeah, yeah what's the history of clientelism with the deputy, a pre-deputy, I mean... Yeah, she's, she's, a, she's a pre-deputy. So, so yeah. is, I mean, what, what would her, or probably 50 years ago, his, uh, you know, links then to similar networks there? And do you see that as a continuity, or is this like a, a new kind of... Sure. Um, I have no idea about the second part. Sure, it's, it is it is um, way out of anything I know about, and it is a great question, and I wish I had an answer. Um, the first part is I can talk about I can talk about how they perceive how it would be different. Mm -hmm. There's so something that they talk about sometimes. Um, the the Patronus, So initially, that choice was made because what they were doing was illegal. So Mexico had really strong laws for a long time about giving any sort of aid to to illegal migrants. Whether or not those were enforced was a sort of different question, but they were very aware of the fact that those laws were, were on the books. So the, the idea was that by not incorporating, there was no actual legal way for them to get in trouble. Right? This is the, uh, the thought was like, we're just people who are giving food to other people. We're not an organization. We're not in anything. We just do it. We don't know who they are. We can give food. There's not a law against giving food to people, right? So if you don't know and you're not an organization, right, it gives you this, this sort of out. At this point, they're, they're not an NGO because they have, so they, they have a number of relationships, especially with um, the sort of remaining social justice parts of the Catholic Church in the area. And there's, there just actually was a new priest who got assigned to the municipio there in, which is on Atlan. And that guy um, is amazing and awesome and really like focused on social justice. So he's been a huge benefit, but he's only been there for a year. Um, so in terms of getting donations and stuff like that, they, they can take care, take care of that through Caritas or through some other partner organizations, um, and they, they they see themselves as being becoming weirdly vulnerable if they incorporate or they become an NGO in terms of how they can be taxed, how they can be like like for they I, I don't know all of the, the details, but they definitely see, I can tell you they see themselves as vulnerable in terms of, like yeah I could go into that more what my perception is I'm really wary of saying something that's too strong or, or not quite right um, especially not looking at my like notes from that in front of me, but the perception is that they would be actually weirdly be more 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 vulnerable because they all have jobs outside of this. They all like or their or their spouses do. You get a sense of how the the deputy might have viewed it differently, or, or oh. whether she treats them in a particular way because they are the non legal entity? Yes, she wants them to she wants them to be an AC. So she comes comes in and is like, why aren't you guys an AC? Why aren't you guys an AC? Why aren't you guys an AC? I don't know what the particular mechanism that she wants to push through that is. But she definitely it like pushes them to do that review. Alright, well thank you very much. I started a business from scratch in 1991 with my 
wife. We were the only two employees. And uh, I had to work a second full-time job for the first nine years that I was in business. In my family, uh, there, there was no college fund. It was either get a job or, or join the military. I graduated from high school a year early because I had to get a job. Two of my brothers went in the military, and I hope to be to be uh, following in, in their footsteps here with, uh, uh, with, with public service. But uh, we, we have got to, uh, we've got to uh, find ways to, to, uh, to, to deal uh, with these, these issues in a way where, where we can operate across party lines. That, that's, that's crucial to serving all of these questions. I 
object to what the WTO does in the sense that that's all they look at. They have that narrow, narrow view of just the profitability and the trade relationship, but not conditions in the world and making them better. They also make their decisions in the dark. They're not transparent. We can't find out about the deliberations, and that's wrong. I do believe the WTO is an institution in need of significant reforms. The Congresswoman is right. I mean, what is happening in China, you look at the all and gone, and what is happening to them, and, uh, the way that these, these people, because of their, uh, their religious beliefs, are, are being their hideous experiments being conducted on them, very similar to what Mengele did in, in Nazi Germany. Um, we have to continue, and that's again what I said, 80% of the people in this world I believe are reasonable people. We can never stop uh, recognizing that. We can never stop giving people hope even if they live in an oppressed country. But here's the point. Despite all of the, the trade disparity and, and uh, China not being uh, willing to get its currency in line and all of those things, um, we can never stop interacting with them. Those that, that suggest that as much as we resent the human rights violations in, in China, the fact that if you happen to, to, if you want to have a child and you have a daughter, that that daughter's life may be taken because you're not meeting a quota that after birth that that child could be murdered. And yet, and yet, in spite of all of that, in spite of all of that, because of their concern about...